Well, I, I uh, want to welcome you all back. And it's uh, my privilege to um, kick off this section by introducing the moderator, who's Bruce Lewinstein, who many of you probably know. He uh, has been a news junkie, I guess, from the very beginning. Grew up in a journalistic type family, and that they, uh, from the very beginning, um, subscribed to three newspapers and that he remembers the San Francisco Chronicle, the Palo Alto Times, and the San Jose Mercury News. So it's no surprise then that he's become, he's now the professor of science communication in the departments of communication and science and technology studies here at Cornell. And he's uh, very active in all kinds of areas of science communications, particularly uh, informal science education, as well as mentoring many of the uh, students interested in doing journalism here uh, through Cornell. Cornell doesn't actually have a journalism school, but it, it's Bruce's. <laughs> I would say it's Bruce's school. Uh, he, because he singly, almost single-handedly and very capably carries the torch for science communications here on campus. He uh, is a mentor to many students and he takes advantage of many opportunities for uh, public communication of science. So with that, welcome, please welcome Bruce. Thanks very much, Linda. I like to say that my father was an engineer and my mother was a journalist, and so it's just genetic that that's just how I ended up doing what I, what I do. I should say that my mother, who's 85, still reads three, three newspapers a day. Um, anyway, thanks everyone. I hope you've all had uh, a good lunch. Uh, it was a really fascinating set of discussions uh, this morning. Uh, I was going to make some kind of joke about we had three really interesting discussions, and then we also had three food, World Food Prize winners but I'm not sure that really worked. But um, Our goal today this in this afternoon session, talking about finding the food security story, uh, is to explore how those issues that were raised this morning, how they actually get out to beyond President Scorton and the G20 uh, summit and actually become part of a, of a global conversation that is reaching not just the elites in academia, but the broad publics of many different kinds and so forth. So to do that, we're going to have um, four uh, well-known science journalists come to, to, quite distinguished journalists, come to sort of talk about how they, how they get their story, how they decide what counts as a story, uh, how they even define what this beat is uh, that, they're, that they're covering. I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to introduce all four of them now, uh, and I'll sort of say their name again as they come back up. Uh, and then each of them will talk for about 10 minutes, then we'll all come up to the table and we will have uh, a discussion both between them and with you joining in, including those of you who are Twitter friendly. Uh, there is, I can't quite see it on the bottom of the screen, but uh, if you don't already know, there is a Twitter hashtag, um, hashtag IPCALS50 that you can use to, uh, to contribute to the conversation and to also be asking questions because I'll be trying to monitor that as we go along. So let me tell you who the uh, four speakers are. We'll start with John Miller, who's based here in Ithaca since 2006. He's been the executive director of Homelands Productions, which uh, is a radio, also video production, some, some video production, but mostly radio. Um, he's a freelancer as well. He's reported from Asia, Latin America, Africa, Europe, as well as the US. Uh, for almost every media organization you've heard of, NPR, BBC, CBC, Marketplace, PBS NewsHour, uh, Voice of America, Radio Netherlands. He's written for major magazines, New Yorker, Condé Nast Traveler, American Way, Christian Science Monitor, and lots of others. For 13 years, he lived and worked in the Philippines and in Peru. And because of that sort of combination of international experiences, uh, I think that much of his reporting has focused on issues of global change. A couple of big recent projects, multi-program projects, one was called Worlds of Difference, about the responses, the responses of traditional societies to cultural change and working, profiling workers in the global economy, two issues I think that we actually heard about a bit this morning. His most recent project has been as executive producer of Food for Nine Billion, a project about which I know we'll hear more uh, later. Our second speaker is Roger Thoreau from uh, currently living in DC. Uh, 
he has escaped the grind of daily and monthly journalism after having spent 30 years at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, since 2010, he's been senior fellow for global agricultural development at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, where he has time for the kind of long, in-depth exploration of food security issues. While he was at the Journal, he spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent based in Europe and in Africa. He's covered uh, global affairs, including end of the Cold War, the reunification of Germany, the release of Nelson Mandela. Ask him later about his story about the first, just as he was about to get on a plane going to uh, South Africa for the first time. Um, the end of apartheid, the wars in former Yugoslavia, humanitarian crises, and so on. In 2003, he and his Wall Street Journal colleague Scott Kilman wrote a series of stories on famine in Africa that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting. In 2009, the two of them published uh, uh, the book Enough, Why the World's Poorest Starve in an Age of Poverty, uh, and uh, for which they were awarded Action Against Hunger's Humanitarian Award, and they also received the 2009 Harry Chapin Why Hunger Book Award. He'll talk later about his, his a more recent book and his current project. Our third speaker will be Eric Stockstad, who represents the new younger generation of science journalists, um, the ones who started as scientists rather than as journalists. Um, but he escaped, as he, that's his word, not mine, escaped. Uh, after majoring in geology at Carleton College, he received a master's degree in geology from the University of California at Riverside where one night while standing at the Xerox machine um, photocopying yet another endless stack of papers, he had this thunderbolt. Um, he was really much more interested in learning about all of science than about learning, learning nothing about all of science rather than everything about one little narrow part of science. Um, so he escaped via the certificate program in science communication at University of California, Santa Cruz did an internship at New Scientist magazine and then ended up uh, since 1997 at Science Magazine. Covers environmental research and policy with a focus on natural resources and sustainability. His beat includes agriculture, forestry, fisheries, conservation biology, and related topics. Particularly relevant to today's session, uh, his feature story about Norman Borlaug uh, uh, was selected to appear in an annual volume of the best American science writing. It was in the 2010 um, edition of that, of that book. And finally, um, we have, in a sense, the opposite end of the kind of global reporting that, um, that John and, and Roger talk about. Um, Lori uh, Rottenberg represents a, a different part of the spectrum, the sort of the small, locally focused story, the small publication story. Uh, Laurie's an award-winning journalist who's reported for the Boston Globe, the New York Times, Chicago Sun-Times, and a range of other publications. She has covered everything from political campaigns and travel and sports through international news, so it's not that there's no international. Um, but much of her current work has focused on food sustainability issues especially for online magazines like Grist and Modern Farmer. She's widely recognized for her feature and news writing and magazine stories. She's twice won the prestigious Peter Lissagor Award as well as awards from the AP, UPI, uh, and the Chicago Newspaper Guild. So as I said, we're gonna ask each of them to come up and talk for about 10 minutes. Uh, I'll be sitting right down there and I'll start waving uh, funny pieces of paper at you if you start going over time. Um, then we'll bring everybody back up to the table, have a discussion, uh, which as I said, you'll be, I'll have a chance to be a part of. My first experience with radio was doing the morning announcements at my high school, which was the weirdest experience of sitting in this little tiny booth and knowing that your voice is getting to all these homerooms. <clears throat> Not that anyone was necessarily listening, but um, it is great to be here and uh, Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? So uh, I want to talk about the project that I just wrapped up. We had our last story last month, about a month ago, uh, called Food for Nine Billion. And this was a story, uh, a series that uh, was in the making for, for several years uh, and ended up being a partnership between the little journalism cooperative that I run, Homelands Productions, 
uh, based out of my attic here in Ithaca, and the Center for Investigative Reporting in Berkeley, uh, and very close collaboration with Marketplace, the public radio program that we don't get here in Ithaca, uh, a daily business show, and PRI's The World, which is a BBC co-production, and PBS NewsHour, and with some assistance, uh, key assistance from folks from Cornell. That worked. I'm, the hardest part of the presentation was being sure that the <clears throat> that the button would work. Uh, so, Food for Nine Billion was uh, we don't really use the word mixed media, but that's an art term. Uh, we did radio, we did TV, we did interactive features, online videos, a whole bunch of products that came out of this project. Uh, and because this is. Uh, Radio, I figured mostly, most of my work's in radio, I figured that I should include a, an iconic image of bite-sized pieces for the ear. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if everyone knows what that, that, that is, but. Uh, so the pieces that we produced for this series were small in general. I mean, they're not tiny, tiny, but they're small. So uh, six to eight minute radio pieces, uh, eight to 10 minute television pieces, not so many blog posts, but generally short, and then tweets, which I did for the first time, and then hundreds of times thereafter, uh, are teeny tiny. So lots of little pieces. Uh, and the journalistic challenge in general is to take big ideas and stuff them into small packages. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading above there. I apologize, remembering what I, what I said. Uh, this project was sort of ridiculous in its concept, which was to try to tackle this gigantic question, which was how are we going to feed ourselves as the world population grows to 9 billion and the uh, resource constraints get more and more difficult with water and climate and land and all that. Uh, quick aside, originally this was conceived as a series about hunger, which is a really interesting topic and would and we went to some shows with the idea that we'd like to do a series about hunger, uh, and eh, nobody really wanted to deal with hunger. So, uh, if you want to do something about feeding the world <laughs> more generally, you know, we'd be into that. So, okay, retooled a little bit um, and reconceived this as a project that's exploring the next 30 years or so and how's, just how's the world going to do it. Ridiculously broad topic and an essentially unsexy message, which was that uh, it's more than just producing more food. It's a lot of stuff. Food is really complicated. Food deals with culture and society and with politics and economics and technology and everything you can think of. Uh, so if we were going to deliver one idea to the American public, it was that it's not just about growing more food it's, uh, or producing more food. It's about a ton of stuff. And, each one of those things in itself is going to be complicated as well. Uh, and put that in the context of primarily this is a broadcast project. You need to put things in these little chunks, ideally with no numbers in them, no names, no names of institutions. Nobody gets their job titles you know, fully reflected. It's all small stuff. Uh, and uh, the way broadcast works, I mean, I don't know if you've listened critically to radio or, or, or watch television. It's super condensed. This is an MRI image. This is the most scientific image of my brain uh, while I was putting this project together. Uh, I've done a few of these big projects, and you get this. It, it interferes with your sleep, uh, trying to figure out how to tell this big, complex story in lots and lots of little pieces. And in this one, I, I, you're not meant to necessarily be able to read all those words, although they're, they are, are meaningful. Um, if you're going to do stories about the world, food system and, one, and, and our ability as a species to keep ourselves fed, you got to deal with production issues, and so you got to deal with plant breeding, and you got to deal with management, and water, and efficiency, and uh, genetics, and constraints, climate, and so on. You've got to deal with the consumption side, with waste, with uh, meat consumption, or dairy, and uh, weather, and how that all works, and overconsumption, uh, nutrition. You have to deal with socioeconomic issues, the, uh, the politics of food, the economics of food, from the farm level on to the household level. T 
tons of stuff. And where? It's like, oh, we got to have, okay, we're going to try to tackle this huge project. Better go to Africa. Better go to South Asia. Should have something from China. Definitely got to have something from India. Uh, we should really have something from the U.S. too. You know, that people, people sort of understand that. And we ended up doing uh, stories from all over the place. Uh, Japan, Singapore, Qatar, uh, Netherlands, in addition to middle-income countries and lower-income countries. And finally, how your storytellers, you want to, we're reaching an, an audience, uh, and this is a crucial point uh, for me, is that this is an audience that's turned its radio on or turned its television on, has not gone to seek out these stories, just happens to be listening to the program. And so it's a not self-selected group of people, and you've got to kind of catch them and hook them and make them interested. So should we do it, find a real strong, interesting character out there? Should we find a a big problem that we should highlight? Should we highlight a solution? Should we do it as a first person story? These are three of the axes on the matrix that was running through my brain for two years or more. Um, stories, this is what we do. We tell stories uh, in journalism. You go into a, a complex world and you try to hack a path through it. Uh, and the, these are old, uh, what you learned in, in middle school, uh, you need conflict, you need a character, you need some action, and ideally you have an arc or some movement over time. Um, so this is ideally, and I think some of the other of my colleagues will talk about, about story, like taking a mass of information with tendrils going in every direction uh, and try to make a story out of it. The night on the left is the same as the night on the right, by the way, just flipped and at a different size. <laughs> See, well, the first journalistic trick of my talk. Uh, something that really concerns me, though, is the story trap. Uh, this is a rare opportunity to show a cell phone picture of my son's room. He's 20. Uh, and uh, that's not like he's, he's not moving in or moving in. This is just the way his room looks when he lives in it. <clears throat> and uh, I went in there, held my nose, camera with the other hand. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the point being that the structures, this, I'm quoting myself from this talk, John Miller, September 2013. The structures we use to make sense of the world are not the structures by which the world is actually organized. So we try to tell stories that do justice to the truth or to, to reality, but understanding that stories aren't reality, and reality doesn't conform to stories necessarily. So just a few examples of pieces that we did, or that I did. Um, this is a story about a fellow named Rajendra Singh in Rajasthan. He was the leader of a national movement of rainwater harvesting. The issue that I wanted to deal with was water scarcity. It's like, okay, we gotta do a story on water scarcity. Where should we go? How about India? Uh, strong character, charismatic, interesting. Only a part of the bigger story, but uh, but he was, this is a character-driven story. Virus-resistant cassava, something that some people at Cornell are involved in. I went to Uganda to talk about uh, the effort to introduce genetically modified cassava there and ended up you know, finding multiple perspectives, pros and cons, uh, or people in favor and people against. <clears throat> um, you know, got to have a GMO story in, in, in the mix. Uh, the Sahara Forest Project, which is a story, really fascinating story I did for television as well as for radio. This is a, a gee whiz technology story. People set up this really expensive facility in the middle of the Qatari desert and um, where, where they're producing food and water and so on. We did one uh, video that got 186,000 views. Last I looked about the hidden costs of hamburgers, so this is the environmental, mainly environmental costs of uh, meat consumption as we do it here in America. Uh, with help from Cornell folks in IPCALS, uh, we produced a world food map, which is an interactive map with more than 170 countries, main food security um, challenges, and 14 different indicators that you could rearrange the map by, with a drop-down menu. Um, similarly, a uh, world food timeline that goes from the beginning of agriculture to the birth of the ninth, nine billionth person, um, advances in agriculture and in nutrition and in the politics of food, and uh, I hope you folks get a chance to check this out. And finally, in terms of outputs, uh, some curriculum materials for high schoolers. 
last slide is so what. Will Bruce, will you permit me to do the so what slide? I've run out of time. Um, when you do a project like this, you reach lots and lots of people. And they're not specialists. They're not necessarily interested, but you reach lots and lots of pieces. And, and after I put millions of eyes and ears down, I, I um, realized divide that by half for the number of people, because most of us have two eyes and two ears, but still a lot of people. Uh, when you do a story, people get a better understanding of the issue that you've done the story about, you hope. That's, that's probably true. Bigger question is whether they've gotten a more sense of the complexity of the overall challenge. Uh, maybe they've heard a few of these stories or seen a few of these things. If you've uh, touched them, then they're more likely to care. Uh, so some sort of emotional impact. And then finally, a big question mark for me is, does that translate into action? Who knows? Uh, sometimes you see it actually with people who've heard your stuff and they do things because of it. But that's what we, I think, all hope, we, whether we have an agenda or not, that people will be moved to do something. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bruce and, and, and Cornell, for uh, having me here. Um, it's my first time uh, to Cornell, but I figured that I know the university uh, and the setting so well because I keep running into Cornell professors, Cornell grads, uh, wherever I'm going uh, around the world. Several of them in particular have been extremely helpful uh, for my reporting uh, through the years. Uh, Pedro uh, Sanchez has always been someone that I've, I've uh, used as a sounding board uh, for some ideas. Uh, Eleni Gabramadin, uh, who for so long um, in her time at the World Bank and, and IFPRI had been almost shouting into the wind of agriculture development, uh, markets matter. Production's important, but produce, 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 you've always got, you always have to have the, be thinking of the markets at the same time. Um, and then, as I'll talk about some uh, as, as we come up to things, um, her then uh, eventually leading to the uh, founding of the Ethiopian uh, Commodity Exchange. Now on the current project uh, that I'm working on, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that, uh, somebody who's been extremely helpful in kind of showing me the way around India, Purnima Menon, uh, who also was here, and then there's a field researcher uh, also uh, either completed studies at Cornell or is still, is still here. So it's been kind of this, uh, I feel I know, uh, uh, I know this community uh, quite well just from the people that I've seen. And then for the topic, finding the story, uh, thank you for including that on the, the, the list of this, uh, or the topic of, of these seminars. And I've spent a lot of time with Ken Quinn at the World Food Prize and uh, Ken and his introductions uh, that he had for, for Scott and myself at the journal for, uh, uh, to Dr. Borlaug. And this finding the, the story and being able to tell the story of some of the great work that is being done here by scientists around the world, uh, the breakthroughs that are happening on the agriculture development front, on the need to do this, on the depth of the, of the hunger, the malnutrition, the stunting problem, why all this is important, to be able to move uh, policymakers, spread the awareness, raise the clamor, as I say, I think that's all uh, hand in hand, hand in glove with everything that you're, uh, that you're doing here on the, on the scientific and the academic setting. So without uh, telling the story, uh, you know, how much momentum can we bring uh, behind some of these, these great uh, advancements uh, that are going on? What I wanted to, to talk about just a little is basically how I got uh, into this. As Bruce said, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal for 30 years, uh, 20 of them as a foreign correspondent. I did what foreign correspondents do. I traveled from country to country, from story to story. I was always on the move, looking for new places, new horizons, new stories, finding the story. Where's the next story? Until one place, one story stopped me cold. It was Ethiopia, 2003, the first famine of the 21st century. 14 million people were on the doorstep of, of starvation, being kept alive if they were to survive at all by international food aid that was running into the, into the country. On my first day in, in Addis, I was based in uh, Zurich at the time with the Wall Street Journal, writing about humanitarian and development uh, stories. Again, kind of a, a, a wide array of, of these stories. So I went down to Addis uh, to write about this, because we already started 
at the journal and, and myself and my reporting, kind of looking at, uh, and, and again with the anniversary of, of uh, September 11th, uh, yesterday, and with President Bush's first address to Congress after that, I think it was on September 20th, and he said, you know, my fellow Americans, you are asking the same questions that myself and in our, my administration are asking. Why do they hate us so much? I've done a lot of reporting in the developing world, and as I was watching it on my television in, in Zurich, I kind of shouted out, oh, I've got some reasons, <laughs> as a lot of you would have who have done a lot of traveling around the world. Started looking into policies that in the United States um, impact people in the developing world. Quickly came to the Farm Bill, uh, the impact of our subsidies, of our food aid program, uh, of the uneven plowing field uh, that kind of exists in the world of, of, of international trade. Uh, then leading to the questions, well, how come the Green Revolution never came to Africa? Bringing me in contact with, with blessedly, with, with Dr. Borlaug. So already starting to look into this realm of food security, agriculture development, famine of Ethiopia in 2003. So I go to Addis, my first day in Addis, uh, meeting with people from the World Food Program. They're giving me a briefing, big map on, on, on the wall on the conference table. Here's the extent of the famine, not only in Ethiopia, but kind of throughout the Horn, running down through East Africa, Southern Africa at the time. I think in 2003, one of the things I was writing for the Wall Street Journal then is Africa was probably hungriest at that time than it had, than it had ever been, or at least in, 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 in recent memory. It was a really bad year. And the person from the World Food Program said as, as the next day we were going to go down to the, to the hunger zones. And he said, he gave me a piece of, a piece of advice, which, which the way he mentioned it, it kind of was a, a warning of sorts, I thought. He said, Roger, looking into the eyes of someone dying of hunger becomes a disease of the soul. What you see is that nobody should have to die of hunger. A disease of the soul? Thinking, my goodness, what's this guy talking about? What am I getting myself into? I mean, I, I had been, as, as, as all of us who have traveled to Africa, inundated with an overdose of medical advice. Take your malaria pills, watch out for meningitis season, you know, cholera epidemics, you know, stay away from that, wash your hands, do whatever you have to do. A disease of the soul? I'm wondering, what could that possibly be about? So the next day, we're down into the, the, the hunger zones, and we're in, in, in the southern area, kind of driving up a corkscrew road to the Bericha Plateau. Kind of drive off the main road, veer into uh, one of the larger uh, villages there, and we came across kind of a warren of emergency feeding tents uh, that had been set up. They were filled with dozens upon dozens of starving children, and children severely malnourished that were being brought there by their, by their anguished parents. So I parted the flaps of one of those tents and I stepped inside and there, for the first time, with all my reporting, I, I'd been a foreign correspondent for about 20 years at that time. It was at that stage that I first time truly looked into the eyes of the starving. Where's my beeper? Is that up here? Here it is. Green, I'm assuming. Hey, there we go. Uh, they were the eyes of Hargirso and Tesfaya Katema. So a five-year-old Hargirso he had brought into the, been carried into the emergency feeding tent several days before uh, by his father. At that stage, Hargirso weighed just 27 pounds, five years old. Severely malnourished. His face was swollen, his, his stomach distended, his legs really thin, spindly, couldn't even stand on him. Too weak to stand. And his eyes, and if you look at his eyes, they're kind of, they're, there's no kind of playfulness that you would expect from a five-year-old or, or kind of baleful beseeching of somebody in such dire situation. They were empty, lifeless, and the eyes of his father, Tesfaya, were, 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 were filled with kind of a, a, a guilt and a questioning, and he asked me a question, what have I done to my son that he got into this condition? It was there in those eyes of, of father and son that I really found my true calling as a journalist. After years, my, my, my career changed at that moment. After all that time of going from story to story, this was one 
that really moved me, that I found I have to stop, this is the one that I need to, 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 to uh, stop and focus on just one story, hunger in the 21st century. How would we brought hunger with us into the 21st century? Because what I saw really infected my soul. There are lifeless eyes in, in life and mind. I started seeing injustices that I hadn't, that I hadn't seen uh, before. My journalistic outrage, or my journalistic mantra became outrage and inspire. I've just started a new website that we're calling outrageandinspire.org, if anybody's interested. Outrage that we had brought hunger with us into the 21st century after the Green Revolution was one of the great technological scientific achievements of the 20th century, but inspire that ending hunger is truly one of the great challenges of our lives that we can do something about, and all the work that everybody here uh, is doing is testimony to that. And so, as I said, my career changed at that moment. That was the one story that I really wanted to, to write about. Kept writing about it for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, became basically a one-story journalist. This is the one, there were other stories that were going on and I had to go off and cover some of them, but this is the one that I wanted to keep coming back to. This one was, I, I was extremely fortunate as a journalist to find the story that really is, is, is my passion and moves me. Uh, and so following my diseased soul, I followed this story and continued writing for the journal, wrote the book with Scott, as Bruce had mentioned, Enough Why the World's Poor, Starving in an Age of Plenty. But enough wasn't enough for me. I had to keep writing about this story. I was really trying the tolerance of my editors at the Wall Street Journal would say, this guy's got to write about other stuff. Didn't you write about the hunger? A couple of years ago, yeah, but they're still hungry. We got to keep writing about this. And so eventually I decided better that I had come to my 30th anniversary at the Wall Street Journal, nice round number, uh, left, joined the Chicago Council of Global Affairs, primarily because there was a landing space where I could do this longer form journalism and really concentrate on writing uh, books and telling these stories in books. Wanted to do the story on smallholder farmers uh, in Africa, followed four smallholder farmers in Western Kenya. Uh, that was the book of the last hunger season. Uh, came out last year, paperback, uh, then earlier this year. My next project then, in case you're wondering, just briefly as I wrap up, whatever happened to Hargear So, following this story, have been back a couple of times to see him. So there he is now. So if he was five years old in 2003, now he's 15. So there he is standing next to his father, Tesfaye. He's half his size, basically. Well, two thirds. So there they are outside. Clearly stunted from the severe shock that he had had. Stunted both physically and mentally. So here he is, hooray, Hargirso, he's in school, because I'd always been wondering what happened to Hargirso? Was he able to go to a school? How was his brain development? 15 year old, he's in school and he's in first grade. At 15, he's learning his alphabet. This impact of malnutrition, of hunger, of stunting, of 160 million kids in the world stunted. This is what my next book is about on the thousand days, from the time a woman becomes pregnant to the second birthday of the child. Hargirso, huge shock at five years old, but from the time that he was born, his father and mother had told me, yeah, they never really had enough for him. So clearly malnourished, seeds of the stunting already beginning then. So that's my next book, as I continue to, to basically follow my diseased soul uh, to, to, to satisfy this urge uh, to keep going and, uh, and, and basically never have enough. So. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, not least because the only other time I've ever been in Ithaca was in February. <laughs> and now I understand how you can actually grow things here. Um, it's also a real privilege to be on this panel because, I mean, as you've seen already, John gets the subject, he understands the complexity, he knows his audience, and I think his sum up, his so what slide, really does capture what we're trying to do. Uh, and, and Roger does what we all aspire to do. I mean, great journalism takes you somewhere. And you can tell he, he does that and he's passionate about it. Uh, and you'll soon see that, that uh, Lori is, is a very compassionate and creative writer. Um, I'm going to do something a little different than what you've seen before. Um, and I don't do a lot of presentations, so as, uh, as Bruce discovered this morning to his horror, 
uh, I learned how many, uh, how many slides <laughs> is too many. So there are a lot of slides. I'm going to go through them very quickly. But um, maybe it's a little payback for all the scientific presentations I've, I've, I've been in. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about science. And science is this bizarre publishing hybrid, which is half learned journal, uh, half science magazine. Um, and uh, I guess uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some specific examples of stories that I've done relating to food security, what I thought made them uh, good stories. Um, and I guess the first thing I'd like to show you is uh, make the point that science has been covering agriculture and food security for quite a while. This is an article from 1916. And if you can read, I don't know if you can read the bottom sentence, but it shows you that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, so we cover food security in policy forums. These are all things that are written by scientists. This is a perspective, original research, and we also run very long review articles. Um, so in contrast to that, what, what the 25 journalists who work for science all around the world are doing, we are looking at people particular projects, events. We're drawn to debate and controversy. We're trying to explain and get people, I mean our audience is scientists and policymakers, into the world of scientists. So one other thing is we have a lot of material online. Uh, Science Careers has information about careers related to food security. Um, this one, I really liked this quote by, uh, by Rebecca Nelson who says, agriculture is not a prestige area in science but it's important to follow your passion. I mean, I think that applies to writing about food security as well. Um, so a quick little story. A number of years ago, uh, the Crop Society of America, Agronomy Society, Soil Science Society, top leadership came to AAAS, said, Eric, we'd like to meet with you. We want to talk with you about something we think you should write about. So they came in and said, plant breeding, plant breeders, very important. We have a shortage of plant breeders you really need to write about plant breeders and why they're important. And I said, I would love to. You don't have to convince me that plant breeding is important, that civilization rests on the shoulders of plant breeders, but that's not a story. Plus, the neuroscientists feel the same way, and particle <laughs> physicists feel like we have a crisis and our shortage of large, expensive colliders. Um, <laughs> so after that, maybe a year or two later, I got a fairly dryly worded press release from ICRISAT. And something caught my attention. It said, hybrid vigor has been achieved in pigeon pea. I've always had a curiosity about hybrid vigor because it has changed our planet dramatically. Uh, so I made a call. Um, and a really, I thought, interesting story came out of it. This is about a uh, plant breeder who spent 30 years at Icry Set working on pigeon pea. And it's his story. Um, but it's a larger story than that. So what made it a story? Pigeon pea, it's important, right? Pigeon pea is unfamiliar, I'm guessing, to most of science's readers because I'm really writing for, not for you in the room here, but for everyone else in the scientific community who is not following what you're doing. So I trotted out the old cliche and went to my editor and said, pigeon pea, it's the most important legume you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's something new, right? First commercially viable system for hybrid legume seed, um, for hybrid seed in a legume. I'd always wanted to write about hybrid, the nature of hybrid vigor. Why now? That's another question we're always asking ourselves. Well, around this time, there was a shortage. In India, there was a, a ban of it. So increasing the yield of pigeon pea, clearly an important thing to be doing. And they recently made an announcement about new varieties. Um, what really appealed to me about this, about telling his story, was that when K.B. Saxena was deciding what to do as a scientist in 1970s, early 1970s, he picked plant breeding because it was clear in India why that mattered. And then the story goes through his 30 years, plant breeding becoming a victim of its own success, funding drying up for the international centers. What did he have to go through in order to finally achieve this? Um, I forgot to start my timer. So, 
an aspect of story that this piece had was it has a character, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and this one really, I mean, has an end, right? It has a, a triumph. Um, so here's another example of a story I did. That's, there's nothing wrong with this story. This was a news story about UG99. Everyone here knows it. Uh, it's kind of a laundry list. We do this story often. Here's a problem. Here's what scientists are doing. A, B, C, they're worried about D. And more research is needed. Um, so, and you know, the headline's not bad, right? Deadly. We all worry about deadly things. It's got the world bread baskets. Probably fewer people interested. I don't know. How can you do this better, right? Put a person there, right? I mean, the headline, geophysicists will read that. Uh, I have to thank Ronnie Kaufman and the uh, Borla Global Rust Initiative because they invited me to one of their meetings at CEO.Obregon in 2009, so I got to meet him, take the picture. Um, an incredible backstory here. There's news, there's backstory, science to write about, um, inspirational. Uh, sometimes I worry with this story about setting the bar too high, right? There's only one uh, Norman Borlaug. So lest you worry that every story, every compelling story, every interesting story has to have a person at the center of it, uh, we do analysis. So here's a recent story that I did, and I thought this was as good a story as is possible where the bottom line is we really don't know. <laughs> Why did I do it? Because pesticides were in the news. The European Union was putting a moratorium on several neonicotinoids. People were talking about it. There was a lot of bluster. So I wrote a story saying, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. Lots of things we don't know. We really don't know whether these things are the death blow for pollinators. Um, surprising, right? We're always looking for something that our reader's going to say, I didn't know that. So what was surprising about this story for our readers, probably not to anyone here? Seed treatments. Amazing. Most of these seeds. And they're colored, right? I mean, the photo says something strange is going on in our agriculture. Um, but what I enjoyed doing was there was also a lot of messaging about if we ban neonicotinoids, food security will really be threatened. Well, will it? Interview scientists find out. I mean, I thought this was, I hadn't seen this anywhere, so I thought this was a valuable contribution. Um, something we're always also looking for is a counterintuitive result. I mean, scientists, I think, are always suspicious of counterintuitive results to some extent, but they are interesting. And readers, if you can give them something that they say, hey, I didn't know that, is interesting. Here's a story I did for our food security package about the idea that if, you eat, if we eat less meat, there will be more food for the planet. This was about an IFPRI model that said, well, actually, in some situations, no. In some situations, if the, de if the developed world eats less meat, there malnutrition in India will go up. Um, so again, this also then draws you into the world of food security models. It's a complicated system. How can something counterintuitive like, counterintuitive like that happen? Um, we also do things that very few other places are going to do. Write about scientists and what they do and their problems. This was a story about the international, I never quite get this right, International Assessment for Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. But it's a, it's, it's a blood in the hallways story, right? This is a story about a train wreck. And what made it interesting was this was a big report that people thought was going to be a benchmark. It was going to be the IPCC for agricultural research. What made it interesting was the conflict between scientists who went in thinking, Biotechnology is a tool we cannot put to the side, ran smack into activists who felt there were value reasons why that should not happen. So this story is talking to people who are in there and have to make the choice. I'm a scientist. I believe that this is going to be an important document. I think it's getting incredibly politicized. What do I do? Do I stay and try to improve the situation by increments? Do I just say, I'm getting out and taking my name off it. I'm not going to endorse it. Um, so here's just a quick summary slide of, of these elements that I'm always looking for, right? Story, current debate or controversy, something maybe counterintuitive if I'm lucky, something surprising, surprising to the broader world of scientists, and take me someplace, right? I may not be able to take you to that hut where someone is dying of starvation, 
I'm probably going to take you into the mind of a scientist somewhere, or some place where scientists are doing something interesting or engaged in something. So I think that's it. If you want to reach me, here's a way to do it. Thank you. First of all, I want, I want to say thank you very much for having me. And I'm so encouraged by the, the young students here. It gives me hope um, that things will get better. I have a belief in my heart that everybody should be able to eat healthy food, and everyone should be able to hear the birds in the morning. And it's my hope that the world goes in that direction. But um, you know, already know a little bit about me. Um, I, graduate, I live in Chicago, so I report from Chicago. And I graduated from Drake University in Iowa, where I had my first, I would say, farm adventure as a journalist. And it was about 1973 or 74. And our professor deci decided he wanted us to go do an investigative piece on cattle mutilations that had been happening in that decade. And I don't know if any of you remember this. Anybody out there remember these? OK. So you have to remember. Some of us, there were people from New York, some of the students were from Oregon, uh, but mostly major cities. And I don't quite remember how we got there, but once we arrived at the farm, we're standing out in the field and we were all wearing overalls. And uh, I don't know if it was the fashion of the time or whether it was just wishful thinking for a journalist, but it was really very ridiculous. <laughs> but um, that was my first ever sighting of a, a cow up close, and it was my first sighting of a mutilated cow, and it was very unpleasant. And the theory behind what was happening, they said it was either um, sort of voodoo worship or that aliens were coming down into the fields and doing this to the cows. So we spoke with the farmer for a long time, interviewed him, and then a group of us started walking off out into the fields. And the professor called us back, and he said, what are you doing? And we said, we're looking for the burn marks from the UFO. And he said, get back in the van, and it took us <laughs> right back to the university. And that was my start of really learning how to be a proper and decent reporter. And pretty much every time when I go out to do a story, I remind myself to not look for the aliens. So um, I did OK after that. Uh, I started working at the Des Moines Register for a few years. Um, Bruce told you the rest of it. But in 1999, I decided to break from traditional journalism because I wanted to take a more of an environmental route and do stories that I thought would be more important to the public. Um, by 2005, I, I could feel the shift going on towards more environmental reporting and even the sustainability issue coming up around 2003, 2004. So I broke totally away in 2005. And probably about three years ago, decided that I wanted to start writing for sustainability um, publications. And that led to a place called grist.org. I don't know if you know what it is. It's an online out of Seattle, very hipster oriented. And a new publication called Modern Farmer, and another one called Next City that will sometimes do um, sustainability stories. But um, for grist, I became one of their only on the ground reporters. They have a lot of, of bloggers. And a story started coming in, in terms of what was happening in, on urban farming and in rural areas. They were sort of mesmerized by it. And they said, we didn't know that we should be covering the flyover states. You know, they always thought the news was on either on the you know, Pacific Northwest or on the East Coast. And I said, well, you know, didn't you know that there are not only young people down here, but there's also a lot of soil? Uh, so <laughs> hence, hence my, my career sort of started with them. I contribute stories. Uh, but I want to talk to you about two that, um, that mean a great deal for me for, for different reasons. One is uh, about four months ago, the USDA came out with uh, reports of an internal study from the 2000 Ag Census. And it showed that there were more women farmers now. It's hitting 1 million strong than any time in history. And that they were even surpassing the number of men farming. And as this started hitting the news, I, you know, I kept looking for stories about who are they? You know, I want to see more about them. And you know, I kept looking, 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 and thought, somebody's got to do this. And it kept eating at me because I, I wanted to know why it was happening and you know, was it more rural, where would they be? And it finally dawned on me one morning, oh, I, I have to do this story. And it was like 
why would major papers not pick up on, on this? It seems like such an important thing. So I, I, I asked my grist editor, you know, would you like a story on, on the increase in women in farming? And they said, go ahead and do it. And I thought, oh, I have to hurry up and get this done before somebody else gets on it. And I did the piece, a lot of research, talked to women across the country, and without having the resources to really go photograph them, I had to do um, a lot of getting photos of them on their farms through lifts, a lot of um, listservs, which, by the way, I, I will tell you at the end is a good way to get stories. But anyway, I got literally almost 100 photos of women on farms, and we ran the piece. And it broke, it just broke through. It broke through everywhere to where the BBC is now doing stories on the number of women on farms, women and both men, two leaving professions to go farm. And it, it just dawned on me, you know, why, what is the problem that major media isn't picking up on what's happening out there in terms of the food system, food security, the shift going on, um, the concern about what we're eating, what we're growing. And, you know, I think they're finally starting to get, you know, get the idea. But what, what happened after, after that story was um, I heard from a woman who had started up a blog called Farm Her, you know, instead of Farm Her, Farm Her with an H. And she said she was going to go out and start photographing women who have their own farms. Um, and she based this on the fact that there was in the Super Bowl, the last Super Bowl, there was a commercial on um, the American Farmer by Dodge Ram, if any of you saw it at all. It showed mostly male farmers. There was one woman farmer, but she said she wanted to go out and go across the country and shoot photos of this new movement of, of female farmers. So I did a piece on her, and we ran some, some photos of it. And out of the woodwork, this was maybe not even two weeks ago, women came out of the woodwork, literally by the thousands, I'm not going to say 10,000, but four or 5,000 female farmers came forward to get a hold of her to be, you know, to be photographed. And the reason that the women give for farming is that they want to make a difference. They do want to change the food system. They say they've always been the nurturers um, in households. They've always been the cooks and that they believe they can really, really do some good. And their efforts are very, very sincere. So, you know, this is an example. I wanted to give you an example of how you find the story. Sometimes they're just sitting in your lap and you think that they're so available or common to everyone that you know, perhaps you shouldn't even advance it or, or go out and do the story until you realize that, you know, it, it's not happening. And, and once people see faces, once they saw these female farmers' faces, um, it made all the difference. It, it was like even the other media started connecting with it, you know, and this is where the stories came out. So that's, you know, one, one movement. The other um, story that made a great deal of difference, I think, um, at least in Chicago, was um, Mayor Emanuel who wants to cut out, cut down on the obesity in Chicago. It's a very chubby city. We have a lot of hot dogs and deep dish pizza, and people sit in the ballparks and things. I think you know about this already. And at the same time, you know, he wants to change the diets, and we have a high crime problem on the south side of Chicago. Uh, jobs are pretty much almost nil there. So they started to establish an urban farm district on the south side of the city where it's blighted. Homes have been torn down by literally like hundreds and hundreds of homes. So the city bought up the property. They're now giving the land back to individuals. Um, they have to go through farmer training, but to be able to, to farm this land. And you'll hear this happening in Detroit, and you know it's happening in Cleveland. But the hope is in Chicago, for example, that they will be able to create a food system as well as jobs, and that in turn, via food, and though it seems like a reach and very uh, utopian in a way, but by treating people with respect and decency and feeding them properly and making sure that they have access to good food, that it would start shifting a lot of other things in our culture, including education, crime, and it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge issue, and there are tiny steps, but it has to do with dignity. And I think that Mayor Emanuel knows this. 
Um, so he's he's done a lot. He's backing a lot of um, new ag laws in Chicago. I mean, these are happening nationally where you can have goats and chickens. And uh, But the turning over of the city land to individuals is, is very interesting. They anticipate when when it's done that there should be about 50 or 60 farms in Chicago, you know, hitting on the outskirts of it. Um, I got to think, I just forgot what I was going to tell you. But anyway, those are those are two of the main stories that uh, that I enjoy very much doing. And how I come up with stories, uh, they come to you, you go out looking for them. I, I'm a road reporter. I go out on back roads and look for things, um, writing everything from now from names of farms that people have created to the number of farmers getting tattoos, tattooing their pigs. But the food security <laughs> issue remains very strong. And uh, you, know, you, you will see more of it. But there's so much happening in cities just to not discount it. And you know, there's rooftop farming. Um, people think that that's just a fly by night thing, but it isn't. All these things will bring food to, to people. It's the webbing and melding together of all these different food systems, be it rural, be it inside a city, being a little bit on the outskirts, that's going to make a difference to bringing food to people in the future. Okay. Thank you. There were all kinds of not only interesting bits about how particular stories come about, but also about how journalists go about getting them, especially like, I mean. Was I should, right? I was right. Yeah, yeah. Lori just had this story sense, right? You know, that's, that's part of what it's about is this gut instinct that you develop about what's what's there, and then sometimes it's something hits you, the disease of the soul, right? And sometimes you go in with a story idea, hunger, and your editors or the people who are going to purchase the series say, no, not quite, right? It's got to be about about feeding. So the other the other thing theme that I saw across all the all of these was about telling a story. A right? couple couple of you mentioned the go back to middle school character, plot, action, resolution. So my question to you initially is how do you develop that instinct? How do you develop that instinct that there is a story here, that there is a beginning, middle, and end, the, that there has to be a, a person when you, know, you did the Borlaug story? What? There's a prescription available from uh, physicians. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'll answer it. In a a very simple way. I think you almost sometimes have to, as a journalist, you have to put yourself in the mind of a child again and and look at the wonderment of a topic, even if it's serious, and, and start asking yourself, you know, the why questions that you asked as when you were a kid. And uh, if you start seeing you're getting some answers back from yourself, you know to go pursue that story. I mean, it's, it starts for me like that. Mm -hmm. I kind of also say, I mean, what 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 you all yourselves identify as a good story when you're when you're reading a book or a magazine article, a newspaper article, uh, something on social media, kind of what what captures your imagination. So it's a it, it, it's a curiosity, and I think kind of overriding everything and all the stories that that we saw, and I think all of us uh, uh, touched on this, is really stories that that are are, are people driven, uh, that can through a, a person. Uh, or several people, or a place, explain an issue, explain a, a, a topic. So it's kind of transporting people to different places, uh, as we've heard, introducing to characters, uh, to people, and then also particularly, I think so critically important when writing about issues that people are 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 un familiar with, so whether it's it's Lori and, and rural America or urban agriculture and the, the, the cities that people in Chicago are walking past these all the time and don't even know uh, that they're there, what they're about, or if it's somewhere in the developing uh, world, to be able to, to tell those stories through the voices of the people themselves that you're writing about, as opposed to us sitting here saying, here's what you need to know, here's what this story is about, <coughs> what are the people themselves saying? So I think the, the more that you can capture the voices uh, of the people that you're writing about, I, I think is really, really important. You know, uh, I think one of the things that I touched on in my little presentation, too, is that, uh, and it's a little embarrassing, I sometimes go into a situation knowing that the topic's interesting, but knowing that it, and the topic's important. 
but the topic isn't the same thing as a story. So you say, well, what can I find as a story? I mean, it seems so backwards, but it's like, this is a really important topic, so I gotta find a story that will help to explicate it or, or um, give it dimension. And so then you go out hunting for, you know, need something about water scarcity, need something about uh, climate adaptation or whatever, and then you look for stories for that. And, and, um, and then the challenge after that is finding, is once you've found a story or two and you say, well, I could do a story about this really interesting project or person or situation, it's like, is it really representative of the topic again? Is it, does it, is it fair to the, the larger question? So I have no answer, but I think that's something that journalists struggle with a lot. Uh, is trying to match story to topic to reality. So part of what you're all saying is that when you're looking for a story, you need that, um, that human interest nugget to get to these issues, right? It's, you're not writing about science. And to a certain extent, you're not writing about food. You're writing about people. People are interested in other people. But, you know, I have the luxury to write about a system. So, I mean, I think I have more flexibility because I'm writing for scientists to, to do a story that doesn't have a protagonist or a story, that, a story that comes out of the, the, the reaction of, I had no idea. I had no idea that there was so much, such an enormous drainage network installed over the last 150 years in the Mississippi River Valley, Mississippi River Delta, Mississippi River Watershed. There we go. I mean, I haven't figured out what the story is there, but I have this reaction of that's, I mean, that's incredible. It's underground. And again, how many people know that? Few people. So there's a story in there somewhere. I haven't got it yet. You know, I, I, I would also say, let me kind of encourage uh, and exhort kind of, of, of scientists, researchers, academics uh, that kind of think of, of, of whatever you're working on kind of how would, you, how would you tell the story, both from your own perspective as a scientist, because you may not think it that interesting, talk about yourself or kind of how you got to a certain point, but for a lot of us that's fascinating. So what, 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 why are you researching this? What got you involved in that? What struck your passion with that? Then also be thinking of uh, who are the people that I would like to actually benefit from that? And if you can, uh, you're, you're, if, if a journalist asks about things, you know, to say on that personality and, and people-driven, uh, thing is, yeah, you could really tell the story of my work by looking at the impact it's having here and these people who are benefiting, uh, who are benefiting from that. So Pedro's talking about Nigeria and what's going on there. You know, Pedro, where in Nigeria is this happening? Somebody would ask you. What village would one go to? What, what, who are the people there that one, that one can talk to? And, and, and to kind of lead the reporters and the journalists, you know, to kind of those areas where they're going to be able to find uh, these 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 uh, uh, human human dramas and, and the human interest. Um, just one second, we'll get to you. I, um, we want to get the mics ready to start circulating. Um, while that's happening, question of this is how you pick a story. What about the other end? What what kind of responses? What's the story of yours that's gotten the most response? I hate to admit this. The story of mine that has gotten the most response was one of the first or second stories I did as an intern. And it was a story about whether the Nobel Prize should be taxed. <laughs> oh my god, people felt so strongly about that. <laughs> um, it's, it, it is hard for us to know. Often the feedback to science is along the lines of, I cannot believe a journalist prestigious as science would misidentify the mouse on page 783 as this, when it is very clearly that. Um, so, I mean, we, we're writing for very busy people, so I don't get as much feedback as I would like. So let, let me know. My, my answer to that question is uh, write about shamans or anything new agey. I think there, there must be a billion of the world's population who lives online and does searches for things like shamans. I assume crystals, I don't know. But uh, yeah, we did a story about shamans in 2004 or something, and we still get requests to use the pictures in the audience. It's amazing. And it wasn't even that good a story. <laughs> um, it probably would have been the, the farming women's story. Um, a second one that got a, a great deal of response was I went out to uh, like central Illinois to do a story on a farmer who decided to start um, doing aquaculture and raising shrimp 
in four big swimming pools he bought at Home Depot, I think it's Home Depot, and or Kmart, um, to be able to come back. But in shrimp farming, farmers are now able to make about $100,000 a year. And this is actually happening a lot in uh, down south where they had the tobacco farms because the farmers can't raise the crop anymore. Um, there's two things going on. One is that they're, they're teaching them how to organic farm, but it takes you know three, four years to turn your land over. The other is so they can't, so they don't have too long of a period without income. A lot of them are turning over to shrimp farming, and that got a great deal of response. So, yeah, I guess I was I was thinking about that. And there's there's uh, some individual stories, but I I think what I'm what I'm at least what I'm hoping uh, is that there's kind of this uh, uh, cumulative response and cumulative impact that I hope uh, is growing say over the last decade that I've been that I've been writing about this uh, in the audience and then through the uh, through the books and and is it is it having any impact on uh, you know uh, public policy things I know that's one of the questions that you uh, were thinking that we could uh, address is kind of the impact of 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 our work, it's, it's it's kind of weird for us individually to talk about it. It's usually, somebody else needs to notice that and say, "Hey, you know, uh, uh, read something." But you know, when if if you're writing books on so nonfiction books on Africa, on hunger, you know, it's not going to be a bestseller. Um, but if it changes. Or if it if it activates or inspires just one person to get involved in that, that's the reason for 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 writing it. So it might be some other stories that I've done that you hear a lot on, particularly when I was writing about covering the Olympics uh, for the for the for the journal. I, I, I covered it was a weird niche at the paper. Uh, so I was overseas, and one of the managing editors he said, "We want to start covering the Olympics." This was big with 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 money and corporate sponsorship and stuff, and the Wall Street Journal should be doing that. And because it was like the Olympics are always like. Overseas, somebody on the foreign staff should do it. So, foreign editor said, he said, is anybody interested in sports? And I said, yeah, Roger is. And so that's how I ended up covering uh, covering ten Olympic games. So some of those stories would get would get kind of, of 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 a response. But if it's just one person that comes up and says, hey, I changed my major because of a a, a story that they read or that they had that they had read a book, then that's that's reason enough. Uh, to do it, so yeah, a million readers is great. But if it's one reader and, and it really impacts them, uh, that's that's uh, all the satisfaction one needs. I want to put an exclamation point on that because, uh, as what Eric, Laurie's example was of an important story that got traction, but the, <laughs> the rest of us are there's less important stories that do, and that sh the danger is that that guides what you do as a journalist, and so the point being that the most important stories aren't necessarily the ones that get the most attention, and you have to keep doing the important stories uh, and convincing editors that you need to do those stories. So let's start moving out into the audience. We've got one right here. Um. Um, U.S. and European musicians have been collaborating with uh, African musicians, Eric Clapton, for example, and produced some wonderful results. We're exposed to their ideas about music and what's good music. I'm wondering if you have some examples of how you, when you're covering a story from Africa, let's say, collaborate with local journalists in your work, or is this a very lonely profession? Sometimes our strength lies in numbers. Uh, it depends the kind of story you're covering in a conflict zone. Uh, South Africa during the apartheid years um, and the anti-apartheid uh, opposition, uh, things that I've done in, in Yugoslavia uh, as that disintegrated. Uh, yeah, then you have, there's a collaboration uh, not necessarily on stories, but but kind of as a whole uh, of of journalists, both say foreign correspondents and the local uh, press in there. South Africa in in the apartheid years, I think a lot of us, uh, the foreign correspondents, really relied on the local on the local press, um, the township uh, press, and they were the ones that were really under pressure under the state of emergency. 
uh, rules on kind of subversive coverage and things. The foreign press, they could just kick us out of the country. The local reporters were, were subject to uh, uh, arrest. They would disappear. Their newspapers would burn their offices. They were shut down. Uh, and so I think for they, they were writing stories that we kind of had no access to or idea of until we would see it there. And so that was, that was a great thing. And, uh, but that, you know, kind of on, on other things, I think, I think for, you know, the for forums like this and other things that whenever we can, can uh, uh, kind of share our, our ideas, there's going to be something to the World Food Prize uh, in Des Moines that will also be uh, kind of a gathering of journalists and how are we covering uh, these issues. So, uh, yeah, I think there is hopefully the, uh, the competitiveness, but also cross-fertilization, I think, of, of, of ideas and, and what's available out there. The, the, also, having worked in the developing world for many, many years, the, um, the unsung heroes of the whole world media uh, system are the local journalists who are risking their lives to get these stories. And when you've got people living in their apartments in the capital cities with the bureaus for the papers and whatever, they're getting their information from the local journalists. It's, um, we're so uh, reliant and should remember them from time to time as people risking their lives to gather news out in the Part of the speeches. Hi. Um, I'm a grad student here at Cornell. I study agriculture. And um, first, I have a favor to ask. And this plays into what uh, Rebecca Nelson's quote was Can you get agriculture as journalists? Can you guys get agriculture back onto um, a more marketable major, a more generate more public interest, make it make it sexy again, make it more pretentious or pretentious. <laughs> 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 uh, my question is, we're all here today and so we all support food security and we're all very involved with this in one aspect or another. How do you what's your goal for reaching out to the readers that that don't have those kinds of values or interests. How how can you, as journalists, as people at this interface of the of the current events and the public, reach out to those people that that just don't don't value food security? That's a really good question, it, and it's one that's coming up. You'll notice if you're following the Twitter feed, one of the questions there is, how do you interest a general public that cares more about Kanye and Kim's baby? than starving kids in developing countries. That was a question that I think you had sent around to us beforehand. At what, so if at the Washington Post, how you'd make it profitable or what headline they should use? Yeah. Instead of Kim Kardashian is pregnant, it should have been Kim Kardashian joins the thousand day movement because she's pregnant, she's beginning the thousand day period, and that would have introduced and people, what's that? She's entering this period that's really crucial for nutrition, for this, for this connection between nutrition and agriculture. And kind of through that, and so it would have been like, oh, that would have caught people's attention. So when you, when, when, when you suddenly mention uh, uh, celebrities or, or something like that. And so unfortunately, that's the uh, way it is. But I, I really, really appreciate your question, because sometimes I think we've all had this, this uh, uh, feeling. I mean, sometimes a lot of us, you know, it's, it's a visual thing. You want to strangle your editors uh, sometimes. But, because they're the first line of, of convincing we need to write about this thing uh, and, and, and this idea, but then also sometimes to kind of collectively grab, grab the readers by the, by the collar and say, don't you get it? Pay attention to this. This is really uh, important. And I think what you're getting at is a really important aspect of, of journalism. We shouldn't just write stories and, and kind of follow a, a, polls and surveys about what readers are interested in, we must also bring issues to them that they need to be interested in. And, and I think that we've, we've, we've sadly uh, strayed from at, 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 at a number of newspapers and, and, and TV and uh, radio. And one word, relentless. Um, if your editor says no, you go back again. Uh, you do your best. Uh, you come at stories from the, the story from a little bit different direction then, or you put a little more of a human twist on it. And if you're that passionate about it, you do what I do, and you, you walk away from the, the regular media and go out and do it yourself at, at all costs. But um, you, you, have to keep, you have to keep at it, and you have to find different ways of telling the story. 
But it, you do get breakthrough. You do get to the people. It, it can happen, but it just depends on, on what voice you're using, you know, what way you're approaching them. But you can't, you can't stop. Uh, you know, one strategy for getting to a broader audience is through, if not celebrities, through things that people care about uh, and the kinds of stories that do seem to be popular are health stories and food stories about their own food. And the local and healthy food movement in the U.S. has been a kind of an entry point for a lot of people who get involved in their local community garden and then they say, wow, we should really do something about our city policy about this, and then they say, geez, I've got an opportunity to go to Africa. It, it's a gateway in to those issues, too. So maybe um, there are some opportunities to find stories that link people to these global issues. When we received our first grant for the Borlaug Global Progress Initiative that some of you mentioned uh, with Dr. Borlaug's help uh, we convinced the Gates Foundation and one of the things that the foundation insisted was that we should have an advocacy budget uh, uh, quite a lot of money that allowed us to hire professionals like Linda McCandless and reach out to people like Eric and, and others and uh, you know that's not something that I think either Dr. Borlaug or I would have put in the budget had the donor not forced us to but it was a real wake-up call. We had to use that money, and we were able to reach out, and we got, uh, you know, uh, impressive stories and uh, impressive uh, 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 media, and it brought a lot of money to our cause. You know, in the next phase, we just one donor gave fifteen million dollars, and they told us that it was because of the stories they read about uh, the issue. It was a collective decision inside their agency. So my question is, you know, should we as scientists be doing more of this? Should we, you know, uh, appeal to donors to put money in our grants? And, money for uh, communication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I'd, I'd, I'd be all for that. I think the more money for communications and for storytelling, the better. Because here's the problem, and bless you that you've done that, and the Gates Foundation requested that. Uh, for advocacy or storytelling. From, and somebody asked a question earlier about uh, the first session about, about NGOs and, and kind of their role going forward. Everybody, kind of from, from, from the, the administration and, and the White House and the State Department with their Feed the Future program and USAID through the, the, the big foundations of, 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 of the Gates Foundation, uh, uh, what Howard Buffett's doing and now Howard's written his own book and so he's telling his stories. Uh, through all the NGOs, the thing that I keep hearing is storytelling. We need to tell our stories, the importance of storytelling. I think for a lot, for some of us, the frustration uh, would be, and particularly particularly uh, uh, those of us that yeah aren't, aren't under the banner of, of uh, it was great when I was at the Wall Street Journal, but now not anymore. And Lori kind of fighting this battle on a daily basis of then ourselves having the resources and the funding to, to, to tell these stories, either on a daily basis or in longer form uh, journalism. So I, I think that whole realization of the importance of storytelling, of the funding being available for it, either through through your organizations or something that then kind of goes directly to uh, the journalists and the storytellers themselves. But then with the acknowledgement, okay, these are journalists, they'll tell the story as they as they see it, so not to have strings attached to that, but you know, it's kind of a method that uh, that NPR and PBS has. I just made a comment. What seems to be the case to me is, if we have this resource, we can make it much more efficient for you. That is, we have professionals telling yes. us, well, this this is a story. Mm -hmm. You know, you you're concerned about the issue, but this is a story, and and they take it to you, and, and so it's it saves you a lot of time and effort. Right. Uh, well, as, as I had said earlier, that, 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 and that's a really good point, right? of, of uh, here's an idea or a story that, that, that we think you know, needs to be told, and here are our scientists who are able to do that, and they have interesting stories, and here's the places where you can go to see the impact of, 
of that. Uh, and so I think that's that's you know uh, uh, important, but also then then letting kind of full range to the uh, to the curiosity of the of of the journalist in terms of no, I, I'd kind of rather go over go over in this direction or or some other place. Yeah, I'll just add um, two things to that. One is, I mean, you can see from John's work how important images, sound, video is to to telling a compelling story and science often doesn't have the resources to either have a photographer in a particular place or send a photographer there. So, I mean, I've used and appreciated the, the great images that the initiative has had on its, you know, Flickr, Flickr pages. Uh, and you also, second, you have very creative people here in communications at Cornell at the initiative. So, you know, you can either, as scientists, if you have something you think is of broad interest and, and important, you can either reach out to us directly or you can you can tap the resources here in terms of helping uh, get some uh, crafting of, of your message and sharpening of it. Do you do you worry as journalists? Do you worry at all about the advocacy question? That is, that if 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 the wheat rest program is coming to you, they're trying to sell you a story, and they're pitching it in a way that serves their interests. Um, and they have their own institutional interests, never mind the good work they're doing, but part of their goal is to stay in business. Well, you hope you actually work yourself out, but anyway. <laughs> do you worry about that? I, I do, absolutely, yeah. I think that's, that's crucial, and I, I'm really um, maybe Puritan on some of the issues of uh, being invited places uh, by organizations, institutions with a story to tell. Um, in fact, I really haven't figured out my own position on that. I mean, I, just one quick story. I was asked to, uh, because I was doing stories for NPR in the Philippines, I was invited by an FAO scientist to go to Africa and document something that he was working on. And his hope was that I would be able to then get it on NPR. And I was thinking, well, NPR is going to pay me 300 bucks for this, and there's no way I can afford to go away to Africa for two weeks on, on that. And so they're going to have to pay for my airfare, and they'll have to pay for my hotel. And if that happens, I can't do it for NPR. So, sorry. And I ended up getting the, the gig in order to do some work for FAO. I could do that. But I couldn't, uh, couldn't sell it in good conscience to a, a legitimate or you know, journalistic organization. So I've got at least three people lined up here, Pedro, and one person there, and then one person over here. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, this is a serious request for advice uh, from you guys. Um, I've been at universities like Cornell, North Carolina State, and so on. And, uh, but coming into Columbia University about 10 years ago, what I realized is there's this mass of people in the cities who have no clue about agriculture or any of the any of the things related to agriculture and uh, maybe not necessarily food or and, and nutrition, but but agriculture. And I, I, people who have intelligent people, uh, important people who have no clue. And then they said, oh, yeah, but I hear fertilizers are poisonous to the soils. Oh, yeah, I hear GMOs are going to destroy their planets, and this sort of things. Well, there's so much we can do by teaching. And indeed, we're, we were able to get students there and, and teach them. You know, they, they, they get that basic, basic principle straightened out. How can we, or you, or how do you suggest we redress this balance of ignorance uh, in our urban populations? Through education. <laughs> I mean, magazines and newspapers are in the business of selling readers to advertisers. So they're not in the business of educating. Uh, some of that happens incidentally, and people here who believe in it try to make it happen, but that's really not the reason they exist, right? They exist to continue making money for the most part, except for NPR, which exists to continue asking for money. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, an, it's, I mean, it's an extremely important, important question. I don't have a great answer for it. I wish I did. Yeah, I, Pedro, I, I, it's something that I've, that, that I've thought about. We talk about the Chicago Council. Uh, I know other organizations are, are talking about this as well. 
is how to kind of uh, foster this more reasoned, rational debate to take the polemics out of this debate on agriculture, of feeding the world, of the nine billion, uh, you know, to realize that that yeah, uh, absolutist positions uh, are are just kind of harmful and obstructionist to kind of of discussing how we're going to proceed uh, on this front. And so I think places like Cornell, the the, the World Food Prize, uh, uh, the Chicago Council. Um, you know, to, to basically bring these organizations uh, together. I, I had an interesting speaking request from uh, at Monmouth College in uh, uh, kind of by the, the Quad Cities area in, in uh, Galesburg in, in Illinois. It's a, it's a liberal arts school, but they wanted to get into more of the agriculture debate. They said, okay, we see this going on at the land grant universities, but isn't this a discussion that's too important just to be left to the ag schools, right. to the scientists, to the so schools of social enterprise. What can we be doing at liberal arts schools? I said, what's your idea? And he says, the main purpose of liberal arts schools when they were founded in the Jeffersonian principle or something is this kind of reasoned, rational debate. And I said, well, there's your role as a, as, as a liberal arts uh, college. And so I think these in the institutions can can also uh, can also foster. So say here you can kind of get the two disparate sides together to have to have uh, and sit up here and have a panel discussion uh, on this. I think would be would be a, a really great uh, a great service and, and a kind of great story to tell. Notice a really interesting point about that response and that I mean the combination of education ver and the it's too important to be left to the scientists. To scientists, that can be a very scary thought, right? That we're opening up the discussion to another set of people to have these things. And yet, the, for those of us who are social scientists who study this process of science literacy and um, public understanding, which is what I do, uh, it's precisely that kind of engagement of respect for discussions, even if they're gonna sometimes be a little tense, that can lead ultimately to some greater level of trust among all the sides that everybody's moving towards a similar kind of position. I don't know, did either of you want to jump in on this one? Okay, we've got a question back there. Yep. Uh, well, thank you all for being here, and I think uh, maybe from the research side uh, or the science side, it's fascinating to hear uh, the journalist's perspective. Uh, my question has to do with uh, what I perceive as a changing landscape for, for journalism, uh, maybe a move away from hard media and in, in my perception, correct me if I'm wrong, less willingness to pay for, for journalistic work uh, and for the kind of uh, information you bring to the public. And my question is, uh, does this constrain uh, what stories you can tell and how you can tell them, and what impact uh, does this have on your ability to tell sort of these hard issues uh, like hunger, like food security? Uh, thank you. So we're all looking at Lori. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, pay pay for journalists. I don't I don't really know some of the larger publications, but overall pay has declined as new staffs have declined and online publications pay even less. Um, Grist, for example, is a not for profit. Um, they operate with twenty only twenty five people in their office and the rest of us are, you know, out in the field as freelancers, some bloggers. Um, it's, I think it comes down to an integrity question, and I think that's a lot. It's not a lot to ask of a reporter because you know they, they should be. Um, sometimes it's a lot to ask of them because you have to, to bleed a lot to do a story like that. You, know, you have to give a lot. Uh, so it's going to be almost reporter to reporter. But yes, it, it, does, it does cut back what you can do. To go back to the, the women farmer story, I could have done so much more if I could have gotten out and driven and talk to, to a lot of these women, I couldn't do it. And that's why I was waiting you know, so much for, for major publications to do it so I could read it. And you know, so I did it, did it in the manner I, the best I could, but it still made a difference. And that's what's really important is you have to try to get the best story you can out there with the funds you're given or the time you're given. I mean, it's really our responsibility. That's why we went into this business. I, I have a couple of thoughts about um, 
those changes and the some of the, the dangers in that. I, <clears throat> I think it's pretty well documented how most of the major news organizations have cut back on their foreign bureaus and that sort of thing. And I think that that really um, is a disservice to the um, to to our audiences. Uh, but there's another thing that's happening too, which is disturbing, and that is that uh, a lot of journalism is being paid for by f organizations with a point of view and with a message they want to get out. And so uh, I don't, I shouldn't be talking about the Huffington Post, but I think that there's, you know, that's a that's an example of a place that's, you know, you basically buy your place in there, and then they get, and, and it's very widely read, but. But the money to pay the people, a lot of the people who write, who do journalism now, especially online, are on salary for somebody else, for an organization that has some sort of an agenda, um, agree with that agenda or, or not. Uh, and I, I think that that's uh, something to be really cautious about. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I think it's a really good uh, uh, question and concerns that you raise and certainly in, in, in the forefront of our minds and deliberations, uh, and, and that there is this disconnect from this clamor. Uh, to, we need their stories to be told, and then, so we're four people up here all willing to tell those stories, but then where is the resources or the ability for us to go and tell those stories? As John was saying, it reminded me that there's been so many foreign bureaus closed. When I was in South Africa, there were so, so many publications, all the, all, even, even all the networks, had, had reporters there. Now there's just a, a very tiny handful, and certainly the networks aren't anywhere except for maybe London. Obviously, you see the same person kind of going from story to story all the time, whether it's in the Middle East or, 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 or Russia or, or, or Asia or, or, uh, or Europe. It's kind of you know these one or two people that are traveling all, all, all over the place. There's another thing that's been cut back on in American journalism, and that's investigative reporting. There's this kind of new, uh, it was a movement or kind of new developments in kind of public interest uh, journalism. Uh, organization called ProPublica uh, set up to basically do investigative journalism. It's, it's, it's funded by, I think, a very wealthy individual or family foundation somewhere in California. Uh, they made the rules very clear. If we want to investigate you, we're going to do it. Thank you for your money. Uh, and if you look at the people who are writing, a lot of them premier investigative reporters on for publications that don't do that stuff anymore. Uh, the managing editor of it was is Paul Steiger, who was my managing editor at the Wall Street Journal for a number of years. I would like to see somehow that kind of model also developed for this kind of journalism, for development, for writing about development issues. Uh, if it would be narrowly focused on, on food and nutrition uh, security, uh, or if it's kind of under a more general umbrella of, of, of kind of, develop, of, of, of writing about developmental issues. So that's investigative journalism, investigative reporting. What about all this kind of, this kind of reporting? So there's kind of the investigative reporter projects that some of you guys have been in, in, involved in. Um, I'm getting some funding for this next book from the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting. Uh, they've realized there's foreign reporting that's not being done, and so they have their own funding means, and then they find journalists to go off and uh, uh, do these type of stories when these proposals uh, uh, come into them. Lori, I was going to mention them as a possible source. Pursue the pursue the Pulitzer Center on, on uh, uh, crisis reporting, and so I think that's a really a really good question that you're that you're getting with, and something that journalism is having to is having to sort through. And if it's, if it's kind of under that guise or that umbrella of funding, NPR, PBS, uh, ProPublica, something for this kind of reporting that we're talking about where funding is coming in, but the work of the journalist has that integrity that it's not impacted by the people who are doing the funding. And if it offends the people who are doing the funding, they can take their money and go somewhere else because there, hopefully there's other people that will do that. So. Our story length has also shrunk over the years, uh, sh much sh shorter word counts. I know they say long form is coming back, and that, that's a good thing, long as the people doing it have a strong enough reporting background to bring in the objectivity in both sides. But it's very, very hard to do a good job on a story when you only have 900 words. Uh, it's calling for what they call narrative reporting, where you, you know, rather than heavy quotes, you, you 
write the story in a more engaging way, a little bit like the New Yorker would do at Talk of the Town. But what you're able to get in a story is very limited these days. Eric? Yeah, just one quick comment, because science is, is different from the other um, things you've been hearing. And science and, and what I do and, and my colleagues have been fairly well insulated from the turmoil of the publishing industry. and. One reason for that is that we're really in scientific publishing, and the work of the news department is essentially paid for by our business model, which is selling peer-reviewed research to libraries and less and less to individual subscriptions. So one thing that that current model of scientific publication allows is science and nature to have news staff that will go out and write about uh, things happening in the scientific community and that affect the scientific community. So the whole open access debate, you know, that's a, that debate adds a question mark to, to our model for, for covering news. Yeah. Uh, my question is very similar to Pedro's. Um, considering the importance of the public understanding of modern agricultural practices, um, because if you have the majority of the public supporting things like GMO crops and other technologies that are going to help feed the world. Um, what's the best way that we can mass educate or get people to understand uh, what our business is really all about and um, to get everybody on board with, or a lot of people on board with, what's, what's going on in modern agriculture and, and why it's necessary? I would say you in particular, uh, you can teach, you can talk to people. I mean, nothing substitutes for person-to-person -person communication. Uh, you can also leverage your knowledge and expertise by, by trying to get that story out through the media. So that they aren't brilliant ideas, but every little bit helps. Yeah, I, I mean, as Lori said, kind of you know, relentless or, or raise to clamor. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying, and it's a frustration, uh, <coughs> you know, for, for a lot of us. I mean, I, I probably have a lot of subdural bruising on my forehead from banging my head against the wall at the Wall Street Journal uh, long enough. Although, depending on the editor, would have very good runs and interest with some of the editors in writing about uh, these issues. And so, it's kind of the, the nature of the, of, of, of the subject quite unattached to the importance uh, of it. And your question about kind of how do we make agriculture sexy, uh, you know, I think a lot of what we're talking about here and just these kind of panel discussions, it's kind of still ahead of its time. It, 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 it's in the sweet spot of everything that we're doing here, but for the public imagination, it's ahead of its time, but it'll, it'll come, because you see that with a whole bunch of other, a bunch of other issues. Uh, you know, say uh, uh, HIV AIDS was kind of slow developing in terms of public awareness of that, and boom, that burst. Uh, you know, uh, uh, climate change, uh, uh, other, it, and, and it's very controversial, but it's something that then people will talk about it at, at certain times. And so I think it, it's, it's still, I, I, I fervently hope that kind of our time is, is coming. Uh, on this issue, and it has to, because as we were talking about the time frames and things, this is an issue that has to be that has to be uh, uh, considered and dealt with, and it's just not going to 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 happen. It'll just get worse uh, through our negligence and ignoring uh, the issue. So at some stage, it'll burst. Be like, well, everybody's talking about agriculture. That's great, and we can say, yeah. Well, 20 years ago, we were all sitting here uh, doing it and 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 debating, uh, yeah, how do we get how do we make agriculture sexy? So. Hopefully, it's time comes. Well, and one thought is to create a global crisis if you have it within your means to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> That's what I, I always try to do. I was trying to figure out who to kill off. Who, right. who, the rock, the, who's the Rock Hudson of agriculture? Yeah, but precisely. That, or, or somebody, because it's not even celebrity driven, because there's plenty of celebrities that are, that are kind of in this, in this realm and, 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 and water and food and, and, and Bono with the one campaign and, you know, the Aids Foundation, Howard Buffett. So there's enough, like, there's plenty of, of kind of rich people and uh, uh, celebrities that are, that are into here. But then again, it's a spark. It's kind of a, it's a crisis. It's a need. It's something that's going to happen that everybody then 
suddenly starts paying attention uh, to this issue. Uh, and then we'll be all prepared with our uh, and well armed with our arguments. So we've got a question here and then one here. There's there's a question behind you you probably can't see on GMOs, but let me sharpen or broaden the question in general. Uh, there are any number of, of specific controversial, particularly contentious issues in, in the food security realm. Let me just mention three GMOs, uh, climate change, and the claim to benefits of organic food. Uh, where there's a big gap between what scientists or many scientists believe and, and what the uh, and what the man or woman on the street might might believe, what could you st talk a little bit about what you believe? The how do you treat issues like that where you have those gaps? And are there any particular treatments or any special responsibilities uh, of the journalist in, in, in those areas? All right. Everybody's leaning back for the microphone. <laughs> I, responsibilities, I try to get things right. I mean, I try very hard to get things right. Um, again, my job is a little different because I'm writing for the scientific community largely. I mean, also for policymakers, and that's uh, an important difference to remember. But um, I, mean, I think my my co-panelists have a, have, a, have a tougher job than I do. So earlier you used the word educate. Is your responsibility as journalists to inform or to educate? I think it's, I think those are related, but for me I don't feel like I have, I'm not a teacher because I don't have answers. I go out and look for, you know, explore questions and share what I found out. Um, I've been, I did one story for this this uh, Food for Nine Billion project that I was talking about. We did 40-something stories in all, and I did one story about GMOs, and it really made me turn to jelly a little bit. I, I, I didn't know how to handle it, honestly, um, because uh, part of the story is that there's controversy. So do you do yet another story about the controversy? Uh, part of the story is that there's an agronomic challenge, or, and do you do a story about that challenge, and here are a few possible solutions. and. It's just how do you how do you treat that? I, th I found it really difficult. There's the, the issue of you mentioned climate change and uh, I can't remember organic. and organic okay. versus so so let's take a fourth is the um, creationism versus evolution thing. Well, that's reached its point in the public debate where people have said you know what enough enough and and I think climate change is about there too. It's like no need to get that one voice in anymore in in a story about climate change. We, we we're past that. Uh, I don't think we're. I don't think that society is at that point yet with GMOs. Uh, I think. I think the controversy is still a big part of the story. Uh, that's a <laughs> an indirect answer. Yeah, and I don't think the controversy is necessarily. I mean, it's frustrating. Uh, depending on what side of the the, the controversy you're on, uh, but that controversy can certainly stimulate interest of, uh, well, what's this about, and particularly depending on who the combatants in the, um, in the controversy are. So it's a matter of kind of, you know, harnessing the narrative uh, uh, of it in a sense, and how do we kind of use that controversy to, to spark this interest or to get people involved. But Bruce's question of educate or inform, yeah, they, I, they kind of are the same thing, but I think maybe what we're all hoping for, or I, I'll, I'll speak for myself, is is just another word, engagement, engage. That we write something hoping that it, 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 it one, it engages the reader, so it kind of entertains in, in a little bit in terms of the way the, the information and the education is, is delivered, but some kind of engagement in, you know, in an issue. And it's funny that when I, I left the Wall Street Journal, that I, I'm, I'm at Chicago Council, and I'm, I'm starting to just write about this issue. And all of a sudden, I was being described as kind of a uh, as a journalist and and like hunger advocate, an activist, and and that made me nervous at the beginning. That oh, now I'm being defined as an advocate or an activist. Do I really want do I really want that label? But the more I thought about it, and I said, you know, basically deep down, I hope all journalists are advocates for the stuff that they're writing about. You know, you take the columnists of the New York Times; they're 100% advocates for what they're doing because they're selecting the issues that they're writing about in their columns. There's an advocacy, there's an activism that is with that. They are writing their columns hoping to prompt change in the, in, in the direction that they're advocating. None of the guys at the Times, but, but, but at uh, anybody who's, who, who has, who's, who's uh, venturing forth an opinion 
uh, on something. And so I, 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 I become more comfortable with that. If somebody wants to call me a kind of a journalist advocate on these issues, I'm, I'm yeah, if, if I use my journalism to engage people, to advocate for, let's get involved in this, let's, let's, let's deal with these issues, I, I, I guess I made my peace with that and I'm fine. Question here? Is it, um, I'm still kind of stuck on the relationships and it seems as though the reporting is somewhat related to the world view. And uh, right now, international programs kind of implies there's a world view that's either changing or being challenged. Um, certainly domestic agendas seem to be evolving as well as the discipline seems to be evolving. So I'll just suggest uh, Doctors Without Borders, Reporters Without Borders, certainly we evolved something different. Certainly your experience, I, I believe you didn't see a black boy from Africa there, you saw a boy. Mm -hmm. so exactly. A man, right. You saw a human being. Yes. So I think that context of our, all of our worldviews, it brings up a different type of story to tell than just a domestic story or ethnocentric story, which is also being challenged, it seems like, these days. So did you comment on that? Because I think that when on the cusp, Doctors Without Borders pushed the medical industry a little bit more on how they viewed uh, medical support and the reporters without borders seems to be doing the same thing. And there's an evolving other discipline in planners, not planners without borders. We spent all this time developing borders between counties and states. <laughs> which I thought we need to go beyond that, you know, to see a better world for all of us. So put it that, that, that's a really good point, and, and as you're, you're mentioning that, I, it, it kind of has me thinking uh, on that, that there probably is more of, yeah, journalism or the thinking of people when they're writing things or the attitudes that they bring uh, to stories of, of less of kind of, a, of kind of a home court uh, feel or not that it would be jingoistic, or anything, but you know, from an American perspective, or you know, uh, I'm from Northern Illinois, from somebody from 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 Northern Illinois, uh, or uh, 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 yeah, uh, a German ancestral position, or a Lutheran position, or something like that. But to get beyond that and and recognize that 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 to to kind of have this yeah borderless uh, approach, I think that's a good a good a good approach for kind of journalists to take. Kind of on any story, is that uh, uh, yeah? I, I'm, I, the, 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 hopefully, there's no limitations to what I'm reporting, and I want to look at this from as many sides uh, as I can. Look, Lori, I had earlier on described you as being local, but of course, you have the international. You've written on international issues. How do you see this local versus international global kind of issue? That's. I honestly, I don't know. I, I don't know. I really, I, I don't, because you know, I haven't done any any really international reporting on on the food systems at all. Uh, so that's a very difficult. That is difficult for me to to answer. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah okay. But but I would say just looking at your work and hearing you that you're writing about local issues, but they're part of this global food yes. chain and this global issue that we're talking about. And these local issues also need to be written about and addressed to local audiences because that'll engage the people in Chicago, the people in Seattle or others that are looking at this at this issue. And boy, if you make the comparison that, hey, these urban farms in, in Chicago are maybe half an acre, two thirds of an acre, one acre, wow, that's the same size of the farms of the smallholder farmers in, in, in Africa. That's what they're feeding their families on. That's what we're trying to do to break up food deserts in, in the United States. So it's like, hey, you all who are working on this farm in Chicago or Milwaukee have this great kinship with farmers in, uh, uh, within Africa because that's basically what they're working on to, to, to sustain themselves. And so, that's a wonderful idea to put in these so people do get perspective and you know, it's something that, that I think I have probably overlooked in, in being told to write local. In, um, sometimes we will draw in things that are happening internationally, such as you know if there are urban farm movements going on, let's say in London or someplace else. But to give that's a wonderful idea to give somebody a perspective of you know look what you have and what they have and what can be done with it. So thank you. We're all on the same. I mean, in this issue, we're all on the same, but we're all part of the same. Uh, the one global food chain, and, and you, you kind of push and pu push on, 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 on one part of it, and there's consequences on, on the other side, which is why in 2000, 2007, 2008, with the food crisis, and there's riots in various parts of the world. It, maybe the impact here is prices start going up. There's some shortages all of a sudden. Uh, it, it's, it's that everything you know happens. There's bushfires in, 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 in Russia, and all of a sudden there's, there's bread shortages in Mozambique. 
you know, it, it, it's, it's this, 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 this again, it, 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 it's, it's a world, it, there are issues without borders. Got a question here? I am a social scientist, and I just wanted to tell Roger Thurow that as a social scientist, I feel there's a point of similarity between journalists and social scientists. We often identify with the issues we work on, or we get identified with the issues we work on. So if you work on GMOs, you become a GMO advocate, or you are identified as a GMO advocate. So I was struck by your comment that you are seen as both an advocate or an activist and also as a journalist. How do you maintain your journalistic integrity and yet talk to people who might be hostile to you because they might see you as an activist? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I kind of see this as, as particularly in, in, in doing the longer form journalism or the books now, that sometimes it's, it's, it's the reporting and the work that I'm doing and the approach to it is very much along the line of a social scientist or of an anthropologist or of an epidemiologist. Uh, that is is getting you know spending a lot of time in communities and 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 and, and uh, with certain with certain types of, of people. I guess uh, I would I would hope that uh, yeah you try to to still you know look at all sides uh, of the issue. And kind of being a, being an advocate or something is for an issue, right? Means that uh, you have to uh, you're not you're not taking sides uh, of, of, of the issue, but you, you want people to kind of pay attention. There will be some, some points that you say, yeah, this is, this is right, or this is, this, this is what needs to happen. Uh, but then it's, it's hopefully that in the presentation of the stories, very, the, the all sides are, are examined. What one does have the freedom of, I think, what I've noticed in kind of nonfiction journalism or non the, the book writing is that People who are reading the book expect, expect there to be an opinion or a point of view in there. I mean, if you're writing a 300-page book and you kind of, every other page, it's, it's, well, on the other hand, or, you know, uh, uh, indeed, this person has a point to make. I mean, you can kind of have that in there, but you don't have to be, basically go back and forth as you would in a Wall Street Journal uh, story. So it's kind of some liberation in that, but uh, I'm, I guess I'm hoping that, yeah, all the time at the Wall Street Journal and things that you kind of have a reputation. Uh, and that I'm very conscious uh, of. So what, what, these, what, what these folks all think of me matters uh, very, very much uh, in terms of, of what other journalists think of your, think of your work. Uh, just really briefly, the idea that we do care deeply about the topics we pursue and the stories we pursue and the people we interact with, uh, um, you know, I it, it is a challenge, really, at an operational level, sometimes to stay, uh, um, keep from crossing some imaginary line, some shifting imaginary line. But the, uh, but I think it's absolutely true, and I didn't, didn't want people to leave without the sense that we, in the pursuit of objectivity or whatever, it's not driven by a passion for uh, human betterment and 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 compassion for for others. We're just about out of time, and I want to end with a question that came up on the Twitter feed that I happen to know Laurie has an answer for. The, que the, the question is, in this social media-driven world, how do you respond to comments on your online content? <laughs> I have read comments that have made me cry, and it's because I want to call the people up or email them back or Twitter them and ask them, why don't they read the story, because everything is in it. And I talked to my editor about it. I said, can I respond in the comment thing? He goes, don't, you know, it, it, they call it trolling and things like that. And I said, well, you know, what am I, what am I going to do? Because there, you know, makes it sound like it's inaccurate. And sometimes people have very good comments also, but it's very rare because these comments go on forever. <laughs> and they said, we have, we have something we have in the office and it's a saying. And I, I said, what is it? And they said, well, we wear shirts that say, quote, unquote, don't read the comments. And, and I thought, well, yeah, that's, that's probably a, a very good idea. And subsequently, was it more than three days later, when in one ear, went out the other, I called him and I said, oh, you know, I, you know you, do you want me to respond to this? Somebody said something was horribly written and didn't have any facts in it. And he said, he just said, I'll talk to you later, I'm, I'm busy. And about three days later, I got a t-shirt in the mail that said, <laughs> don't read the comments and I wear it, you know, or I look at it when I'm writing and I, I have to remind myself to not 
do it. And is it right to give a, a really quick case in point? There's a, a national musician from Iowa. Her name is Susan Werner. And she she's writing about, do you know who she is? Or, well, she's writing, she did a, an album called Hay Seed or a CD that was funded. Um, she's turning the money back over to sustainability places so they can help farmers. And she wrote a song that says pesticides made me gay. And it talks about, um, you know, that she grew up on a farm and that you know, from ingesting these things, her parents, what were they thinking? They were farmers and they did this. There was this rash of comments, you know, about being homophobic and all kinds of things. And it was like, she's gay, you know? <laughs> you know, you know? And so I, it was just one of those things, you know, finally, you know, what do you do? So I, I called Susan and I said, please just put a comment on because I'm not supposed to be looking at these. And she, you know, finally did, you know, say on there, I'm, it's, it's like a, a song about myself, folks. You know, and then everything finally went away. But. It's, it, there were probably 40, 50 comments just going about that. And it was people didn't read. And there was even a, a little link where they could listen to the song, and they didn't. You know, but it was, she was doing it to kind of educate, to bring out, um, talk about two things. You know, herbicides in some cases aren't good for you. And you cannot go and say people are gay because of this or that. It's, a, it's something that people just, just are. So there's an example. So one of the slides that was up, at, um, I think it was one of John's slides, you said what's the, the problem? You couldn't so give what? a single message because it, um, it's complicated, right? <laughs> so I think that's what we've heard today is that there's no single answer to these problems of dealing with GMOs or controversies or telling stories or dealing with advocacy and so forth. It's complicated, but we, what we've heard are four people who are really working with it, and I hope you'll join me in thanking them. Thank you.